What's up, everybody? We back. R2C2. Another week. What's good, cuz? I love this sweatshirt you're wearing. It's a terrific hoodie. It looks fantastic on you. Yeah, man. It's vacation. Va- my vacation uh, hoodie. I always bring one hoodie on vacation. And I just wear it the whole time. <laughs> you know what's funny? Isn't it like the more reps you get packing, traveling, whatever, you do have certain things like you're like, okay, no, this is the way for me to to get through a trip. I I do the same thing, one hoodie, but for my road trips for work, where it's like, I'm going to wear one hoodie on the plane. I'm going to wear that same hoodie to shoot around the next day. I'm going to wear that same hoodie if I'm just chilling in the hotel room and that same hoodie on the way back. Because if I start packing multiple hoodies, then it gets bulky and it's tough for me to fit my suits in a garment bag, fold it in my rolly bag. But I do all this so that I can just have my rolly bag and my backpack and that's it. Oh, yeah. See, now I, t- I normally pack a lot. Um, in this, 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 trap, this trip, I packed a big suitcase. But if I'm packing in a, like a carry on, then I'll just pack one of, you know what I'm saying? One of everything. Yeah, but like you, when, you, if we going out on a boat and stuff, I always want to. I always want to have like sweats in a in a hoodie. To be honest, like for the boat day. Yeah, just to cover up, not get. Yeah, you get it gets windy, I'm, gets I'm a little weird. chilly. I'm weird like that. Yeah, like on on the <laughs> way in, I always want to have my hoodie to put on. <laughs> I get it, man. Uh, by the way, going on a boat could be the greatest, could be the best vacation excursion. Like the family feud answer for what is the best excursion on vacation, boat ride. Yeah, it's got to be boat day. Boat day is all because, you know, it just breaks up the the day at the resort. You know what I'm saying? Like the kids get a a different look. You can jet ski. You got the sea dudes. They got the little raft out there for you to lay out. So it was a it's a good boat day. I wanted to ask you this. I don't think I had before or I have before. This time of year, pitchers and catchers reported last week we talked about. Now full squads have reported. This is now the fourth spring training that has not included you, right? Yeah, this is my fourth the, year being retired. It, is there any part of you that hits this time of year and misses it at all? Uh, like baseball? No, hell no. I wish, man. Like I, <laughs> I gotta go to Tampa. Today is we recording this on Wednesday. I gotta go to Tampa on Saturday for a week, and I'm like, fuck. Like, <laughs> <laughs> it feels like you're I, reporting again. <laughs> yeah, man. I'm like, gosh, dog. I don't like. Nah, I'm good, man. I did that shit for so long, man. And like, I, no, there's nothing. I don't. I don't miss anything. Like, nah. I, I like. I normally, I mean, maybe the first year I felt like, you know, I'm missing some stuff because I want to be in the clubhouse. You want to see what the guys got going on and all of that shit. But I'm not even in that realm anymore. You know what I'm saying? Where like I'm in the in the clubhouse discussions or what's going on in the clubhouse. So like, nah, I don't. I'm going to go down there, hang out with the guys, watch some bullpens, play some golf, and then I'll see they as an opening day. <laughs> <laughs> Do you... Still feel connected to a lot of the guys who are on this team? Yeah, I'm still connected for sure. And that's the reason why I still like to have the Yankee job is a, is to still have that connection. Whether it's Tommy or, you know, Judgy or, or Aaron Aaron Hicks. I play golf with him during, uh, during the Super Bowl week. Um, you know, even Nestor. You know what I'm saying? Like, so, yeah, I mean, those guys, I think I'll always – I, I think I feel like I'll always be feel like I'm connected to that organization. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I, I still, you know, I'm still rooting for him, still pulling for him. I still check my Instagram feed and all of that stuff every day to see what's going on. But I don't I don't miss actually being in the mix and being in Tampa every day. I saw uh, Gator is down there, though, uh, back as a special assistant. So that's good. This is the first time he's been back since, I think, I retired since the pandemic. So to have some of those guys be back around, I think is really cool. I think that's the coolest part about being a Yankee in spring training is to see some of the older guys come back. Is Andy going down to spring as well? Andy is the pitching coach for, um, first of all, first of all, Luke is a senior this year. So he's, he's coaching Luke his senior year. And his youngest son. Leah, his youngest son, and uh, he's a pitch coach with WBC. 
Oh, that's right. So, that's right. So, so he's, he's tied up with that. that. Yeah, so yeah. he's doing that. David Gettys, his bullpen coach. Um, and then even for me, like, you know, I go down to spring training. I hang out with Harky. That's who I follow around the whole time. His ass is leaving. I get down there on Saturday. He leaves on Monday because he's the pitching coach for the Netherlands for the WBC. Oh, wow. I didn't know that. Yeah, so he's the – he's the uh, well, I think the bullpen coach for the Netherlands. So he'll be uh, – I think they start in Japan. So I'll be – I'll see him. Uh, in that in that first group, yeah. Oh, that's right. Because you're going out there then. I'm going to Japan, yeah, for the first round of the WBC for sure. W- when do you fly? When do you go out to Japan? Wait. I leave March 5th, so I wow. go. I, I I get get back from this trip. I go to uh, Tampa for a week, and then I get back on the third, and then the fifth, I go to Japan. You're gonna need a period of rest at some point, man. I I, I don't see any rest. Anytime soon, cuz. Like, <laughs> no, no time soon, cuz. Yeah. Because then the WBC final is like the 19th, 20th, and 21st in Miami. So it's, uh, it's, a, busy, it's a busy spring training. You know, you mentioned how you keep up on things and what's going on on your Instagram feed. And I wanted to share something with you. I don't think I've shared it yet on the podcast. I have been off my Twitter timeline since the second week of December. Wow. I have, yes. The only exception I made, <laughs> I made an exception on the NBA trade deadline. That day, the actual day of the dead, the, the deadline, I logged into my feed and like followed for a little period of time to see what was going on with everything and obviously the KD trade and everything else. But other than that, since the second week of December, I have checked my mentions on my laptop a couple times. But other than that, I have not been logged in checking my feed at all. I, I Being on my Twitter feed is officially out of my life now. I love that. But is it? don't you feel a lot better not, like, like, like not checking oh, that thing all the time? Yes. Yes. I feel so much better because... And that was actually sort of my thought process behind it. I was noticing when I would log on, I tried to think, how many times do I feel good after I go through this? And it was basically n- never, right? Because never. E- yeah, because even, even if the content you were taking in is not content that feels inflammatory or upsetting, the actual process technologically of having all these things thrown in your face and scrolling through over and over again, it puts you in some sort of fight or flight response, right? So it's never a relaxing activity to be on your Twitter timeline. Even if you enjoyed the content you were reading, it's not relaxing. It could be distracting, but it Mm -hmm. is not relaxing. And I just sort of evaluated it and said, I am not, this is not enhancing my life. And I was thinking about it, you know, in our business, you always feel some sort of obligation to be connected. But I was like, anything I really need to know is going to get to me, period, the end. And if I ever really need to say something via those channels, I have it there and I can. But I don't need to be... And I'll occasionally log on, tweet something real quick, and then log off. But I don't need to be wasting hours of my life on my Twitter timeline. And like our business or, or what like we do or what you do and like in the media, you don't have to be first. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So like you, you don't need yeah. to be first to break news or like you don't need to be like the first one to put something out on Twitter. So like you said, whatever you need or whatever, you know, you feel like is, is for you will get to you for sure. It's so true. Even for example, I wasn't on my Twitter timeline at all when all the Kyrie stuff went down. People would just text me links to Sham's tweets, links to Woj's tweets. The information's going to find its way to you. Tim Ferriss Absolutely. has this. He, he has this philosophy with news. See, he's like, I don't read the news. I don't need to. Anything that comes my way is supposed to. People are going to send to me stories that I need to be aware of. I need to follow, and I don't need to pollute my life with being stressed out consuming news constantly which is obviously targeted towards negative stories right and yeah i just 
I, I'm never going back, see? I will never again be regularly logged into my Twitter timeline, scrolling, wasting time. I'm done with it. And I, uh, it's so much happier. I also think about the time I waste and how many other things I could be doing that are more fulfilling and satisfying to me. Even if I decide to take you know, 20% of the time that I was on my Twitter timeline and devote it to reading, it's like, okay, now all of a sudden I have you know, 10 pages a day I wasn't reading. And I really do find reading to be not only entertaining and stimulating, but fulfilling. When I read, I feel good, man. Yeah, it, it's it's some you got you can use that twenty minutes to watch some new shows. Uh yes. full swing on Netflix. Have you why have you checked it out yet? It is so good. It's so good, man. It's so good. If if you guys haven't watched it yet, check it out. Full swing on Netflix. Full it's, swing on Netflix. I, I, even I'm Amber's only on the second check is she re- and that that tells you, right? Like how good yeah. it is. Because you don't yeah. have to be some huge golf fan. Um, see, the the idea is each chapter they follow different golfers, right? They fi- they, they follow different golfers, yeah. In, in each yeah. chapter, um, I think I'm only the first on chapter two. In Justin and Thomas, Justin Thompson, yeah, Justin Thomas, yeah. And then two is uh, two B- Brooks is, Kepka. Have you watched? Two is Brooks Kepka. Yeah. yeah, I'm excited for that. Yeah, and then yeah. they get into like the live golf, like Ian Paul. It's it's good, man. It's really good. I think I'm on episode four right now. I got uh, the rest of it downloaded for this flight, so I'm about to watch it on this flight. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah, I'm on episode two. Episode one, I was... It's so funny. I had totally forgot that Justin Thomas won the PGA last year, and I'm watching it nervous if he's going to... Like, if if he's he's going to win. What? What was crazy is I've been watching so much golf the last three years. So soon as it, like I had forgot, but then soon as I saw Zella Torres and then I saw, uh, I can't think of the guy, uh, Pierto, whatever his name is, when he, when he hit the bad drive, I remember watching that. Like I remember watching the PGA and I remember him hitting the ball into the water and like fucking up on 18. Double bogey so then, 18. Yeah. Double bogey 18. So then they had the, the three hole playoff. I remember all of that. Like, I remember watching the Masters and Scotty Scheffler going crazy. So, yeah, it's it's cool to like like relive it again. You know what I'm saying? Like it's it's pretty dope, man, to see the behind the scenes too. And like for me, golf is so mental that it's like cool to see like their thought process and like what these guys are thinking and all of that different stuff. It's a lot like pitching. So yeah, it's cool to watch that. It, I will say. If a doc is done well, right? If storytelling is done well, it makes you care about the principles, the subjects, and it brings you in to something that maybe otherwise isn't entertaining to you, right? If you think about yeah. if you think about golf, obviously for a lot of people they are not entertained by just watching the sport of golf. But if there is someone who you feel connected to, you are going to be entertained. The most dramatic example of this and us feeling connected to something and it making us into whatever activity that person's doing is our kids, right? You, you yeah. wouldn't you wouldn't just, you know, I wouldn't just watch anyone glue construction shapes to construction paper and be into that. <laughs> right? <laughs> but <laughs> but because it's Evie, I'm like really into it. Same thing. I'm sure, you know, you wouldn't naturally go to, you know, cheer competitions or dance competitions or whatever, but because it's Jaden and Saya, you're into it, right? And but it's even with the, it's like the same thing they did with F1 too, because you get into yes. the stories of yes. the people. Yes. Whether it's Danny Ricardo or Max Verstag or Verstagen or, or all these different guys, like you get into the story of the person. You know yes. what I'm saying? And what's crazy is when I was I was playing golf, I was playing golf out here the other day, and I was playing with some people and they and they had watched it already, and I hadn't watched an episode, and they were like, they were talking about Brooks Kepka. And they were like, Man, he comes off like a douchebag in the show, right? And I, cause I hadn't seen it yet. Yeah. And I'm watching the show, and as an athlete, I'm like, he don't seem like a douchebag to me. He seems like a lost athlete. Like he's trying to figure out his shit. Like he had it, he was hot, and now he's got all of this stuff, and now he's trying to get back. You know what I'm saying? Like, yes. So just seeing, hearing different people's perspective on how these guys come across, 
is interesting. You know what I'm saying? And it makes for good conversation because the way I watched it, he didn't seem douchey to me. He just yeah. seemed like an athlete that's super lost. You know yeah. what I'm saying? Like, so it's uh, it, it's it's cool. Like you said, when the doc is done right, how people can get different different perspectives on you know on the same uh, on the same thing. We're watching the same thing. It, it, it's what NBC has always done masterfully with uh, the Olympics. They storytell, mm -hmm. make you feel connected to the athlete. And then all of a sudden, you're invested in them succeeding in their sport, even if their sport itself wasn't something that drew you to them or that you found interesting. And just to give people an idea for a, you know a brief description about this, Full Swing follows different golfers each chapter and gives a behind-the-scenes, really detailed look about their tour life other things going on in their life, certain relationships, and builds up to some sort of tension then that's going on for them on the course. And so you're getting to know them, getting to feel a little connected to these characters, getting to know their story, and then going along for a ride within their competition. That was so interesting to me, see, even as someone who's an executive producer on Sue's Doc, and feeling, for me, the tension of her story the last couple of years was... Is she going to retire? And then is she going to win another championship? And watching Full Swing further validated for me how that tension is really interesting when you feel connected to the athlete. And it's it was really interesting how I'm sitting there and I'm like, Justin Thomas doesn't want to just be Jordan Spieth's best friend. Justin Thomas doesn't want to go another five years without winning a major. Oh, is he going to do it? Is he going to do it? He's in his own head. And you could, that's the other cool thing. See, when you're talking about like pitching, like you can feel how these professional golfers who you might feel like are impervious to getting into their own head. No, no, no. Just like you and me and everyone else on the course, they get in their own heads as well. And I think that's the biggest thing. I think that's, that's the coolest thing about them opening up in this way is that, you know, being vulnerable and letting people know that like, you know, they think this, they have the same thoughts that we have, you know what I'm saying? Whether it's a bad shot, you know what I mean? Not feeling good that day. I mean, even if you just look at Justin Thompson, Justin Thomas, that, that week that he won the PGA, he wasn't feeling good. You know what no I'm saying? Right. Like, oh, my energy is down. He goes to CVS, buys everything in the fucking <laughs> allergy row you know what i'm saying like yeah, yeah just battling through that type of shit like i think people need to see like you know sometimes like especially young athletes like they always want to feel perfect like oh i gotta feel great to perform well most of the time when you in these situations when you when you're performing great and you in these these crazy situations these crazy uh scenarios your body's going body's most likely breaking down yeah you know what i'm saying when when LeBron's in the finals or or Steph Curry's in the finals in June, they've been playing for eight months. You know what I'm saying? These guys are tired as shit. So to be able to to let athletes see that these professionals, their bodies break down and they don't feel perfect all the time, it just lets them know like you have to play through some shit sometimes. Like these guys, these I feel like this generation wants to feel perfect all the time, mm -hmm. and you're never gonna feel that way. That is so beautifully said, see, and it's so true. I actually really like the other day Anthony Edwards was just talking about how much he dislikes load management and resting games. And some of that is not player driven. Some of that is performance team driven and trying to organizations trying to protect their investments long term and, and with championship goals. But some of it. I think is exactly what you're talking about, see? It's the, oh, something feels a little off, like it's time for me to sit or I have an excuse in my mind not to perform. And it's like, no, that is actually where the real champions separate themselves when they're not feeling their best and they still perform at their best. Yeah. That, I mean, and that's what separates the good ones from the great ones. You know what I'm saying? Is when you can go out there and perform when you're not feeling your best or, or you're not at a hundred percent and you're never going to be at a hundred percent. So yeah, it's, it's, it's good to, that, you know, these like a lot of athletes are opening up in that way to be able to let these, these younger kids see that. Hey, should we turn R2C2 into a golf podcast where we get to interview oh, all of these easy. guys? <laughs> easy. 
I'll do that in a heartbeat. <laughs> I, I feel like you and I would have a blast. What's interesting about it is personalities that are probably need the storytelling most is baseball and golf. Wheelhouses, yeah. baby. Wheelhouses for R2C2. We need to, Absolutely. We need to start getting the golfers through here. It would actually be really interesting to... It'd probably be fun for them, too. To Yeah, I mean, it, it's crazy because they're, they're both so connected. You know yeah. what I'm saying? Like, a lot of a lot of golfers play baseball, and then uh, obviously a lot of baseball players in post-retirement or even during their baseball career play a lot of golf. So yes. um, the, and the thought process is a lot of, is a lot the same. So like I said, I'm headed down to Tampa to, to go play golf. <laughs> I'm going to be at spring training, but I'm going down to play golf. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. See, I also, I, I, I'm very bullish on baseball and its future. And it's funny because I know a lot of people are, or have been for a while now, talking about this sport and how old its fan base is and how it's not fast enough to keep up with the young generation. It's something you and I have talked about many times. How do you continue to tweak the sport to make it in the realm of entertainment it needs to be for today's youth, for today's lack of attention, all of those things. What's interesting to me is seeing that the sport is invested in that as well. That is what encourages me. What I feel really good about, and I'm thinking about the rule changes for this season, which if you guys haven't heard our episode with Theo Epstein where he breaks down very specifically every rule change this year and why they are what they are, I really highly recommend going back and listening to that. But see, I was just thinking about how I'm excited for this season. And part of the reason I'm excited is I do think there's going to be an enhanced level of entertainment without doing anything that totally chips away at the integrity of what makes us all love baseball. And why I'm bullish on baseball and its future is because they're willing to take these steps. The biggest argument about baseball in the past was that it was unwilling to change. It was such a traditionalist sport that it wouldn't look at where it needed to evolve. Well, what we've seen with this commissioner and and this Major League Baseball front office is it is going to take those looks. It is going to put in the research and it is going to be willing to make changes while also having respect for what makes us all love baseball traditionally. And that, to me, excites me about the future of baseball. I feel very excited about the entertainment of baseball continuing to enhance on a level that extends beyond just the core fan. Do you think that's fair? No, I think that's you. I mean, you said that perfectly. I think, uh, I mean, it couldn't put it any, any better because, you know, like you said, for the longest time, the baseball purists have been, you know, you can't touch the game and this and that. And the game has suffered because of, because of, you know, those unwritten rules, you know what I'm saying? Of not being able to touch the game. And now, you know, like you said, we have this, you know, we have a, you know, Rob, the commissioner is willing to put in these rules. The players, have been, you know, with the joint committee, have been willing to, you know, um, you know, approve a lot of these rule changes. Um, and we're going to get some some changes in the game that we need, man, like from an entertainment value, from an entertainment standpoint. Um, you know, it is what it is. Th- these sports now are driven by TV revenue. And, it, and, if the, and if the game doesn't fit within the realm of TV, you know what I'm saying? You have to try to, you have to try to make it conform to, something watchable and I think that's what you know we're getting at whether it's more action the pitch clock um the shift um all these different rule changes um that I'm excited for man and and I was just thinking you know um we need to get some players on during spring training talk about what they think about these rule changes um I had a I did a live zoom with Devin Williams and and Tristan McKenzie and they were talking about in their bullpens uh, having a pitch clock in their bullpens and how fast 15 seconds is in their bullpens um, and have, you know, getting used to that. Um, and that's why I said, I think, you know, the velocity and everything is going to go down. The average velocity in the game is going to go down just because these guys are going to get tired, man. And, and, and uh, not being able to, to, you know, take that minute, minute and a half and walk around the mound and gather themselves to throw the ball as hard as they can again. So I think a lot of th- I think a lot of stuff is going to change, man. I think it's you know we about to we about to see it here in about a week. Um, mm-hmm. 
And I think for me to, to, to get these rule changes locked in and get everybody used to them, it's got to start game one of spring training. First hitter, first game, whatever. The guy ain't in in 15 seconds, ball or strike. You know what I'm saying? Like, we got to put these rules in place right away. I see that's so interesting to me about Tristan and Devin, and I could not agree more. That's a... So Theo's talked to us about unintended consequences or other areas that are affected based on one change or another. And it's really interesting what you just said about velocity, because my first thought, of course, with the pitch clock is just the game moving faster and the value of that. But you bring up an excellent point, see, how it's also probably going to help the hitters, right? And make more contact in the game because, you know, we have less contact than ever before. It's boring to see strikeout after strikeout after strikeout, walk after walk after walk. And obviously a huge part of that is because the velocity is through the roofs for it's, everybody. It's higher than it's ever been. Like the guys, guys are throwing harder than they've ever thrown. And then you wonder why people get upset about guys hitting 240. Well, this motherfucker's throwing 102. Like, you go hit against fucking a guy throwing 102 and see if you can hit fucking 300 against that guy. Like, people get upset about these guys' averages and he's only hitting 240 and all that shit. Well, these motherfuckers are throwing the ball harder than they've ever thrown it. You know yeah. what I'm saying? So, it, it's, it's. I mean, we got to try to bring the, the velocity down. That sounds crazy, but we have to try, man. And I think this is the way this is going to get done. Very interesting. You think we're going to feel the differences right away, see? I think so. But but I think we have to be uh I think they have to be like real strict on the rules. Like right away. That's why I said first hitter of the first spring training game, bam. Like if, if he ain't the pitcher ain't on the mound, if the like if the shit ain't right, like start like start banging people with, with the rules right away. So that by the time March 30th come around, uh, opening day, you know, we at Yankee Stadium and the game is moving along. You know, the game's at one o'clock and we should be in traffic by 345. You know what I'm saying? Yes, yes, yes. That's the goal, man. So, uh, you know, but but it has to start game one of spring training. And and it really should, like these teams should be doing, like when they do their scrimmages right now, whatever they're doing, they should they should have the they should have these rules in place. Pitch clock shift, all of that shit, just to get prepared for next week because the game starts next week. I'm really excited, see, and next week we'll have to talk about after your time in Tampa, some more of the conversations you've had about the rule changes and guys' concerns, how guys are feeling. Obviously, we'll have had some spring games by that point, uh, what the reactions are going to be. We'll continue to stay on top of this, but I think you and I are on the same place, and obviously you're one of the people who is helping to communicate this to the players in your role with the commissioner. But I just feel for the first time in a long time, I feel very confident about the direction of the game of baseball as an entertainment entity. And it is because of their willingness to examine themselves as an entertainment entity and say, okay, we have an amazing base. We have incredible fans. We have a rich history. We don't want to spit on that, but we also want to be aware of this competing world of entertainment, which obviously extends even beyond sports, and how we continue to have our share of the pie and continue to grow it, and what we can do without damaging that integrity, but while enhancing our entertainment. And I think just the fact that they're willing to look and they have access to such you know brilliant and experienced minds, whether it's people like you, Cece, who played the game and now, you know, have this role in the front office, or it's people like Theo who were constructing rosters and now have this role in the front office of Major League Baseball. It just, it makes me excited, see? It makes me encouraged. You know what's crazy is that you said, you, you said it uh, uh, like perfectly again is that I don't think they've ever looked at the game as a, from an entertainment value. You know what I'm saying? Like it's it's always been the game and the sacred of you know sacredness of of the baseball of baseball and America's pastime. But I think now these owners in the league and the players are looking looking at it as it as as entertainment, which it is. And and you know you have to um, conform to your audience. You know what I'm saying? And the audience is saying they want more action and they want the games 
um, shorter, and and that's what we're trying to do. I'm looking forward to it. See, uh, we'll continue to follow this throughout the spring. Going to have some some uh, great guests for you guys throughout spring training as well, leading up to the start of the season. And who knows? Maybe we're going to start mixing in some golfers and getting to know them too. See, because I feel like Man. we just. We just might become the destination for the biggest golfers, I think, when it comes to podcasts. Right. I'm, play, I'm playing at Bay Hill uh, next week, so I, I, I can see if I can get some guys on. Hey, plant those seeds, see. <laughs> no doubt. <laughs> All right. You enjoy the rest of your vacation, see. You guys know the deal. New episodes every Thursday. Bonus episodes as well. Make sure you're subscribed to us on YouTube. Following us wherever you get your podcast. Rate, review, subscribe, and tell everybody you know. See, uh, we'll do it again next week, man. Peace. Yes, sir. Peace.